If you guessed that Brendan Dillon would score a brace in Arizona to help the Jets win a big game on the road, you'd be right. But of course, none of you had that on your bingo card, and I'm sure a lot of you weren't expecting a Nino Niederreiter hat trick to also follow the effort up. We'll dive into this game and some fun questions around the Jets on tonight's episode of Locked On, Winnipeg Jets. You're locked on the Hockey Jets, your daily podcast on the Winnipeg Jets. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Evening, friends, and welcome to tonight's episode of Locked On Winnipeg Jets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host, Harrison Lee, an avid Winnipeg Jets fan and an online blogger. You can follow me on Twitter at HLivingLoco and at LO underscore Winnipeg Jets. As always, thanks for making Locked On Jets your first listen of the day every day. If you like what you're hearing, be sure to like, follow, and subscribe on all of your favorite podcasting platforms and YouTube. Doing so, uh, of course, is always free of charge and ensures you never miss another episode. But most of all, we just love and appreciate your support. Tonight's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app and create an account. And when you do, be sure to use promo code Locked On NHL for twenty dollars off your first ticket purchase. Stay tuned to hear more about how Game Time can save you time and money when it comes to buying those ever difficult to secure last minute tickets. Now, like I said at the top of the episode, uh, the Jets had a weekend game, and it was a predictably strange one, but perhaps not as weird, uh, or or actually it was stranger than I was expecting. Um, the weirdness was definitely off the charts. Uh, if you watch this game, um, I had to watch it back because I was uh, actually out of town, so I was catching a lot of the, uh, the, the action afterwards, and... Yeah, a game in which Brendan Dillon scored two goals and Nita Ryder had a hat trick was probably going to be one that was a little bit on the wackier side. And when you watch this one, some interesting things emerge, right? Because the Jets were a little bit uneven. Um, the first period, I would say, that you know was very back and forth, but the early minutes were very much kind of Arizona's bread and butter. Crash the net, try and create chaos, and on a couple of opportunities, you know, they actually converted, right? You know, Winnipeg made a couple of really bad mistakes. Um, there was a Shifley pass that was kind of thrown up into the middle uh, slot area right in front of Hellebuck. Not much he could have done about that. Uh, there were some jammed pucks. Um, you know, there was a two on almost like a two on O rush where Moser uh, made no mistake on a feed. I think it was from a And, you know, you just see Morrissey nowhere in sight on this counter. Uh, DeMello kind of got burned because he really had no one covering. Shifley was supposed to be the guy back. Uh, another mistake from him. Unfortunately, his back check wasn't exactly um, as defensively resolute as we would hope. But, you know, it's just one of those things where this is a recurring theme with this team, uh, especially this year. I feel like um, in terms of like odd man rushes and stuff, we've seen a lot of those conceded. And it's tough for Hellebuck because usually when he faces shots from sharp angles, right, it, it has to go through a, a pretty big sea of bodies. And we know that like his side to side motion, it's it's a little bit slower. He's a big guy. He doesn't have like the crazy lateral speed of a Vasilevsky. You know, he re relies very heavily on pre-shot positioning and having those good reads. So when he faces a lot of, of cross seam passes like this, it's a lot harder on him. And it's it's tough for any goalie, but especially for Hellebuck. So this was kind of one of those opportunities that if Moser picks the right angle, there's nothing Helly can do. He's just not going to get there in time. And he did. And I feel like the Jets really want to work on shutting those passing lanes down. It's tough enough to give up those counters to begin with, but especially to surrender that cross slot area, the Jets might want to sell out a little more and shut that pass down to at least give Hellebuck a fighting chance. Because if he's facing the shot and he doesn't have to move as much, I think that there's actually a better chance of him making that initial save than there is the one on the pass. But, you know, it is what it is. You, you sort of pick your poison. You're going to have to take a tough lump either way. And in some cases, Hellebuck has actually been able to get to it on those cross slot passes. But this time, not the case. Thankfully, though, the Jets didn't really let that get them down. A brilliant passing sequence that capped off a, a Nino Niederreiter tipping at the other end saw like three or four different Jets touching the puck. And you know what? Appleton had a nice, I think it was Appleton had a nice assist on this one. Uh, Appleton in general has been 
pretty good. Or this this might have been the, the Mesnikov assist. There were so many players on that line who had points that evening um, that it's a little hard to remember exactly how it played out. But overall, I mean, this is one of those great sequences where everyone contributed, right? And it was a great zone entry. It was a great possession inside. Arizona's defense kind of seemingly froze a little bit. And Niederreiter just positioned himself perfectly on the inside. I would say like to the left of the slot, just enough to crash the net, tips it in, and it is a perfect play. Um, I think this actually might have been Appleton's assist. And then we saw another one where this was the Nemesnikov assist. It was a Brendan Dillon goal, if you can believe it. Uh, a lot of patience from Nemesnikov to draw some attention. And he just sort of outweighed Arizona's defense, got a bit of a slower pass across the slot, but it, one that made it nonetheless. And Dillon just kind of, I would say almost shoveled at home. Uh, it somehow got through Carol Vamelka, which, you know, Vamelka in the past has really been Winnipeg's kryptonite, but this time it actually got through. And then, of course, you know, all the good vibes kind of got sucked out a little bit when the Jets had another PK and Lawson Krause jammed a greasy one home. Frustrating, annoying, and also not super shocking that the Jets gave this one up. But thankfully, Winnipeg didn't let that deter them. Nita Ryder got his second of the game. This one was, uh, yeah, uh, I think if this was the one that was the one that was sitting on the goal line, sort of just jammed it home. Uh, you know, he, he had an opportunity that sort of leaked through Vimalka and Nino cashed in and made it count. And then, of course, Brendan Dillon strikes again. Uh, this one was a, a beautiful snipe. A great, great behind the back pass from, or not really a bet behind the back, but almost like a spinorama pass from Appleton. Appleton saw Dylan kind of coming off the weak side and found him for a perfect, perfect wide open space. But of course, Dylan's not really the kind of guy that you would expect to score. Instead, he slaps one home, an absolute beauty snipe, and then he's on a hat trick watch. But then, of course, lo and behold, Nino Niederreiter finishes his hat trick. Uh, this one, this may have been the goal line one. Um, either way, a beautiful, uh, <laughs> a beautiful hat trick, even if it was a little bit on the greasier side, it's beautiful by Nino standards, right? Though this is his game, right? For checking effectively getting into the dirty areas, uh, just sort of jamming stuff home, but occasionally finishing off with some pretty snipes. I would say though, that Nino's game over the years has really kind of lived around the goal mouth area, right? A guy who is very underrated as a grinder. And while he's not really a defensive presence, his physicality and skill down low makes him an absolute menace. And I think in this game, we really saw that reflected. Would I say the Jets were great in this one? Yeah, a little bit mixed, right? There were some there were some high danger chances that Winnipeg gave up to a, a scrappy Yotes team, but the Jets also created some dangerous opportunities on the, of their own. So yeah, I mean, a big road win, nice to stop the bleeding. And now the Jets get to face the Blues on Tuesday, which we'll talk about on another episode. But obviously, uh, amidst all of this, there were rumors that Nino Niederreiter wants to stick around. We'll talk about him and some of the trends of players perhaps resigning in Winnipeg in just a little bit. Before we go any further, though, I do want to shout out our friends and partners at Game Time. When it comes to buying tickets, a lot of you know that it can be a huge pain in the butt, and especially those of you who like deals. Well, you know, sometimes it's hard to save money, and it's especially challenging when you're trying to find last-minute tickets and you get hit with lots of fees. Game Time knows exactly what you're going through, and they want to make your next big event as easy as possible to get into. Game Time is fast and easy to buy tickets, including last-minute ticket deals, flash deals, and of course, they want to help you have the best experience. You're not getting any mysteries here. You're actually going to get an in-venue seat view so you know what you're buying into, which is, for me, always really important because I don't want to have an obstructed view. If I have to miss a goal because there's a huge pillar in front of my face, that would really suck. Game Time wants to make things easy, and they offer so many ways to uh, to save money, right? They offer a lowest price guarantee, event cancellation protection, and so much more. So if you're ready to take the guesswork out of buying tickets, download the Game Time app, create an account, and use promo code Locked on NHL for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code Locked on NHL. That's L O C K E D O N N H L for $20 off your first purchase. Download the game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. 
Hello, friends, and welcome back to this episode of Locked On, Winnipeg Jets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Every day, thank you so, uh, so much for joining us as we talk about um, some interesting stuff surrounding Nino Niederreiter. Obviously, Winnipeg has made a couple of really big trades over the last few years, but Nino Niederreiter for like a second has ranked, I would say, probably among Winnipeg's best deals. Nino last season in his like 22 odd games had 13 points, was pretty solid. After yes, or this weekend's hat trick, he's now got nine points in 11 games. And honestly, it's part of the reason that I've been um, an advocate of him perhaps getting a promotion to the top six, because I feel like he's just a pretty good finisher. And with his skill down low and stuff, I think he'd actually help uh, some of the finishing problems that plague the top six. But, you know, with with Nino, it's interesting, right? He's not really being paid a lot right now um, in terms of like a big contract. I think he's making like between like three and 4 million at present, which for what he's bringing is pretty darn good. Uh, you're not going to find many better value options. And so his next deal, I think is an interesting question because he does want to stay. His agent, I think is already considering it. He's already talking about wanting to stick around in Winnipeg. And, you know, I, I would be curious to know if he opts for like term over big, uh, salary. Perhaps he takes a lower salary to uh, stay around longer and have more guaranteed money, or does he want to kind of do a shorter term contract? I, I don't know what the deal is here. Um, I saw somebody talk about maybe three, 3 million by five years. That'd be a really good deal for both sides. For Nino, it gives him some you know stability and, and guaranteed cash for the next several years, basically towards the tail end of his career. For the Jets, they have a very reasonable cap hit that quite frankly for the next two to three years is going to give them some like sensational value. I've always been a big fan of Niederreiter. I think he was a player that I've probably uh, talked about at least a half dozen times in previous seasons. I love him. I think he's a great player. And I think for the jets, he's basically been found money. The fact that Nashville basically tried to give him away um, and is now trying to get Connor Garland instead says, you know, an interesting bit about, Perhaps they made a mistake there. Uh, I, I think Nino does a lot of the same things that Garland does. I think he's very skilled. And um, I think Nino has really been underrated throughout his career. But it starts to reflect a trend recently of players wanting to stay in Winnipeg. One thing that I think has always been a criticism of the Jets is that they don't retain free agents and they don't retain some of their top talent. Now, in some cases, that's actually benefited the Jets. I think in Truba's case, the Jets kind of maybe dodged a bullet with his contract. I think he would have wanted a little too much. And given his performance with the Rangers being a little bit uneven, perhaps the Jets were right to walk away from that. But, you know, in other cases, Winnipeg has occasionally signed really big deals that ended up hurting them long-term. Uh, the Wheeler deal really does stick out. I think that is one of the biggest albatross contracts the Jets have had. And it's understandable, right? He's your captain. He's the face of the franchise. You want to keep him around. But the problem is, is at the age that he was when that deal was signed and went into effect, you kind of realized it was not going to go very well, especially with the signs that were already showing that he was kind of on a downward trend in his career. But now we have Shifley and Hellebuck and potentially Nino coming back. Who would be next? And that that is an interesting question, right? Because like Connor and Ehlers are going to be due up for extensions here pretty soon. Ehlers, I sort of wonder about because there seems to be um, perhaps some frustration on his end. And, you know, with how the coaching staff has deployed him this year, I'd have to imagine he also kind of feels a, a modicum of pressure. The one thing that I've noticed with him this season is that it does feel like he's lost a step. You know, he's not as explosive. He's forcing passes more frequently. And people will say, well, he always forces passes. And that's not really the case, right? With Ehlers, he's usually very smart about where he wants um, to create good shooting and passing lanes. This year, it feels like he's just trying to make things happen, and I wonder if it's because he's compensating for a lack of mobility. He's had a lot of injuries over the last few years, and if that stuff is starting to catch up to him, the Jets might have to walk away. Um, I love Ehlers, and he's one of my favorite players, but if he really is not recovering at the rate that you want him to, and he's not the player that he once was, I sort of wonder long-term what it means for his health and his career as a Jet, which is crazy to say, because like I just never thought we'd really be in this position, but he's missed a lot of time over the last few years. 
He doesn't look right this season, and maybe it's just a 15 to 20 game thing. Maybe over the next few weeks, he starts going back to being the confident, creative player that he's always been, and we don't end up having this conversation again for a long time. But, you know, with him needing an extension pretty soon, I just wonder how all of that's going to play out. Uh, when he's at his best, he's one of our best players, just period. There's not really many skaters on this team that match him pound for pound in skill, transition ability, uh, vision, passing, shooting. I mean, he's got basically all of these elite tools, but if he's losing the skating part, that's going to make so many other things a lot harder for him. And I really hope it's not the case because like, he is one of our most effortlessly creative players. I love him, and I really would prefer not to see him in a in another jersey so let's cross our fingers and hope that it's a temporary thing connor i think is a much more complicated question because in terms of what he does finishing wise he is truly a monster in front of goal but the problem is is that getting him there and having him make use of all of his tools is a lot harder than it should be he's one of the most naturally gifted players in the nhl but he just doesn't make the best of his like the most of his tools that he has and it's you know something that drives me crazy i think it drives a lot of fans crazy perhaps even the coaching staff at times has expressed frustration with it because you can tell that he's thinking about these things but he just doesn't really have the you know the wherewithal at times to execute on all of the parts of his game that should make him an even bigger threat like if he fired on all cylinders all the time he'd be like a hundred point plus player he's that great at what he does but the problem is is that the rest of the stuff that he doesn't do has really held him back from reaching like that next tier of of player but hopefully you know the jets are are patient with this one i think it's a really tough question because he is an amazing goal scorer but it comes with a lot of i would say uh asterisks right there's there's a great player there, but you have to do a lot to get him to that point. And clearly playing him with Shifley is not the way to do it. So a lot of questions there. Um, but but speaking of Connor, and I think he's kind of a, a really good lead into this problem. I guess there's a question of who Winnipeg's worst enemy is. And honestly, it's Winnipeg. We'll talk about why the Jets are kind of in their own way in a lot of instances in just a little bit. But before we go any further, I did want to shout out our friends and partners at FanDuel. Score early this NFL season with FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. Right now, new customers can get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's $150 if your team wins. For those of you who are Vikes fans, this one might be uh, an interesting one. Obviously, you know, Minnesota's had a bit of an up and down season. But for Ravens fans like me, you know what? As like a new time customer, uh, this is a great opportunity. I know Baltimore is a really strong team. And I'm sure a lot of you have seen them kind of rip apart teams like Seattle and some of these other opponents. Minnesota may be a little bit more uneven. But you know what? It's five bucks, right? And with Minnesota's occasional ability to pull off some great wins, that means that you can get $150 in bonus bets. If you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's never been a better time to get in on the action than now. The app is super easy to use, and they offer a wide wide range of betting options, including spreads, player props, over-unders, and so much more. Getting started really couldn't be easier. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and kick off the NFL season in style. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. Hello, friends, and welcome back to these closing thoughts on tonight's episode of Locked On, Winnipeg Jets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks for joining us as we talk about a big question that I think some folks have, uh, certainly one that I've had in the past, and that question is, who is Winnipeg's worst enemy? And I think the answer to me is Winnipeg. Uh, You know, I I think the Jets are basically the main reason uh, for their own lack of success this season. The Jets have kind of stood in their own way. And look, there's a couple of things happening, right? The goaltending from Hellebuck and Brassois has been a little bit on the average side, uh, perhaps a little bit below average, if we're being honest, especially by Hellebuck standards. He's been bad by his standards. Uh, Some of what's happened hasn't really been his fault, but there have been other games where I feel like, you know, especially earlier in the season, some stuff that got through him probably shouldn't have. With Brassois, he's just looked shaky, and I think that's the best and kindest way I can describe it. But elsewhere around the roster, right, what continues to be the boogeyman? 
Well, it really comes down to special teams. The power play and PK have been nightmarishly bad. Uh, the PK ranks among the worst in the NHL, and the power play isn't much better. It's it's scored a couple of times over the past few games, so it's not nearly as dire as it was to start the season. But make no mistake, both uh, sides of the special teams coin have been really, really bad. And it's strange because you look at the Jets and at even strength, if you look at you know their expected goals and expected goal share and stuff, the Jets are actually up there among the top uh, echelon of the NHL in chance creation and controlling play. But when it comes to these special teams mistakes, the mental gaffes, even at even strength, the defensive breakdowns, Winnipeg has kind of stood in its own way. And some of that you could actually change if you make some adjustments to the roster. I think especially on the back end, the mobility and lack of foot speed has been very apparent against teams like Vegas, where the Jets just don't really have an answer for how fast in transition these teams are. But I think if you made some adjustments, maybe you bring in Jizzle, maybe Heinola when he's finally healthy, gets some minutes. I think this can kind of alleviate some of that stress. But I also think the Jets really need to focus on making the power play and penalty kill uh, a priority to adjust. Some of that is tactical, right? Like on the power play, I think Winnipeg really needs to stop asking, you know, Kyle O'Connor to be the primary shooter on this unit. As effective as a one-timer he has, like he's just not making the most of it. And teams have long since figured out when he's going to be the trigger man. They can sort of see how the Jets are telegraphing the pass and they cheat for it, right? Like they really do make it very hard for KFC to finish off his chances. So I think Winnipeg really needs to add like variety, right? The most effective power play the Jets had was 2017-2018 when you had Shifley down in the low slot area. You had Stastny who was kind of just, you know, floating around the back end area, saucing some great passes. You had so many other options to uh, make use of a very dangerous power play unit. And the second unit was also pretty decent. With this year's team, and it's been a case, you know, been the case over the past few years, both power play units are not great. The second unit has occasionally had some pretty good looks, but the first unit is pretty dry. And even with Perfetti's addition, it's not really changing tactically all that much. It's a shame because like, I feel like the Jets' power play should be a lot better than it is, but it just feels like something about the way that they distribute the puck and who they're using on a frequent basis, it's missing, right? Like the off-the-puck movement isn't rapid enough. The passing is a little bit delayed. Everything's too choreographed. There's just too much predictability with the Jets' PP setup. And then the PK really does not pressure at all. Like the penalty kill diamond just offers way too many shooting and passing lanes for opponents to take easy advantage of. And I think it's been especially bad this year. It's it's really like Maurice days where the Jets PK just sort of sat and hoped that Hellebuck could absorb the damage while the Jets skaters occasionally blocked a few shots here and there. That's just not an effective strategy for the Jets to kind of come through with this. And I really feel like Winnipeg needs to go back to what it did last year where it was a lot more active, it put a lot of pressure on opposing puck carriers, and it actually gave the Jets quite a few breakaway opportunities. So the Jets' PK really needs an overhaul, the Jets' power play needs an overhaul, and the back-end mobility needs an overhaul. You try and fix at least like two of these things, and I think the Jets' season is going to be a lot more successful. I would prioritize the PK and the back end mobility more than anything. Cause like if that gets fixed, I think you'll see an improvement on the power play naturally, but we'll see, right? Obviously the season still has a long ways to go and the jets are likely to make some deals over the next few months. But let me know what you think the biggest problem for the jets is. Do you think Winnipeg is its own worst enemy? Do you think it's something else? Drop your thoughts in the comments below or at my social medias at Adrian living loco and at LO underscore Winnipeg jets on Twitter. For tonight's episode, though, that is going to be all the time that we have. Thanks so much for making us your first listen of the day every day. We'll see you here tomorrow for thoughts on Winnipeg versus St. Louis before they take the ice. Have a great night and go Jets go.